Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here in Seoul and um, opening up the next couple days for what I believe will be a great discussion and hopefully a lot of learnings for everybody here. So um, this morning, I'm going to talk about what is seems to be the most sought out animal today, which is unicorns, um, but really talk a little bit further um, in the context of what it means to have unicorns or produce unicorns in this day and age, and what really goes behind it in terms of building um, an ecosystem that truly is sustainable and supports startups. All right, so uh, very briefly about myself. So um, my name is Christine Tsai. I'm CEO and founding partner at 500 Startups. Um, my entire um, upbringing, education, and career has actually been in not just the San Francisco Bay Area, but in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, right around kind of the dot-com boom and bust. Um, that is when I joined a small company at the time called Google and was there for a number of years. And really was a transformative time for myself, but also for the company and for Silicon Valley and technology. So I feel quite fortunate to have had that experience, um, as well as a number of colleagues who went on to do great things. Um, so for an example, one of my colleagues um, at Google went on to found a company called Instagram, which was acquired by Facebook. There's a number of other uh, ex-Google folks who went on to venture and do a lot of great things. Um, and in 2010, I left Google to start what became uh, 500 Startups. So this morning, I'm going to start off a little bit on what exactly kind of are the dynamics of unicorns. And one thing I do want to preface is that I've certainly seen this in the last couple of years here in Korea, but frankly, in markets all around the world. And really, I don't actually think it's so much an obsession just with the unicorn unicorns themselves, but kind of what unicorns represent and what they symbolize for different markets, um, either whether it's governments or even with corporates, and I know there probably are a number of, of corporates in the room, um, but really like what the dynamics are here, why there's such um, a strong interest um, and urgency to either get access to unicorns or to birth and, and be kind of be able to say that unicorns came out of our market. Then I want to share a little bit about 500 and our learnings as we are now turning uh, we're nine years old this year, and next year will be our 10th anniversary. But kind of what we've seen, not just in Silicon Valley, but um, all around the world, as our portfolio has now reached about 16 unicorns around the world, and kind of what, what we've seen happen. And then finally, um, a lot of this is based off of our own observations. What are the different key ingredients to building um, not just an a, a ecosystem for startups, but something that's truly sustainable? I mean, one of the things that I've noticed is that for Silicon Valley, we've had that time of almost 50 years to develop into what it is today. Many markets around the world want to create that in a much more compressed time frame. And the, the interesting thing is it's, it's already starting to happen in a lot of these markets. Um, so without, you know, without the time, like what are the things that can be done um, with that urgency to, to, help, um, to help speed that up? All right, so um, I think one of the things I want to start off with, just, just so that everybody's on the same page, is you know, what defines a unicorn? So if you remember, that term was coined in 2013 by a well-known Silicon Valley investor named Aileen Lee, who I, I, know, I know well, and we've co-invested in a number of companies. And at the time, I don't think she ever thought that it would become now used in a, you know, all the way around the world in Korea um, and in other parts of the world, but it has now become a very um, iconic term in venture capital and in tech. But really, when that, first, that term was first coined, it was defined as a privately held company, um, tech-enabled or tech-driven, tech valued at over a billion dollars, and it was primarily focused on US-based companies. Today, fast forward, unicorns are actually not that special. Now there's decacorns and pentacorns, I don't know, like uh, things that are much bigger than just the unicorn. So it's, it's, being a unicorn is not necessarily that unique anymore. Um, and the other thing is that they're not just in the US. So of the you know, more than 400 companies in the unicorn club today, probably more than half of those are outside of the US. And we actually see that in our own portfolio as well, which I'll go into later. I mentioned before that of you know, the 16 so unicorns in our own portfolio, 
probably almost half of those are also from outside of the US. And so um, in terms of like that being defined as what unicorns are, then the next question probably many of you have is, I think a lot of you are very interested in it. I heard some of the, the, um, the great speakers just before me mentioning unicorn a few times um, as they spoke. So what is this, um, you know, why is there this strong influx of unicorns as well as the strong interest in, in creating them or getting access to them? So um, there's a number of reasons, um, but one of the one things I will start out with first is what you see up here on the slide. So number one, there is a lot of disruption that's just happening around the world in different industries by technology. And so I think what you can see here is that big companies, especially in established industries, and especially for ones who are just not tech enabled or not really catching on to technology and integrating it into their core products, they're dying faster than ever. So the, the graph here represents kind of the average company lifespan on the S&P 500 in terms of years. You can see it's just really dropping. So I think in the 1950s, the average lifespan of the company was maybe about 60 years or so, you can see right there. Today, you know, the average lifespan is much, much shorter. Um, and by 2030, the prediction is that the lifespan will be cut even shorter, 13 years. So what does this mean? For a lot of these established companies, they, they feel this urgency. And I see this day in and day out when we meet with large, very established corporations from all around the world, definitely from in Korea, and they have this urgency that if they don't act now, they will be disrupted themselves and they will be irrelevant. So there is this, uh, what we call FOMO, or fear of missing out, but there's this urgency to, to innovate and not um, be killed by these unicorns or, or these much more nimble startups that are being born, but how can they embrace that um, innovation themselves? So this is kind of one of many reasons as to what has led to this influx of unicorns. But before I go on, um, just touching on a few other points, when you think about why are there, why is it, where is there's kind of like phenomenon of unicorns? Um, so one thing I mentioned was certainly around the fact that these startups are starting to disrupt existing industries and frankly move faster and innovate faster than the established, um, you know, the incumbents out there. Um, second, you know, some of this story actually even begins even earlier, back if you remember 2008, when the economy took a downturn and, you know, there was actually an influx of tech startups that came out as the economy started to rebound from that. Um, I definitely saw this just from my vantage point when um, I was at Google during the time and saw a lot of startups that were coming up that we were working with um, on the developer side at Google. So, so that's definitely one in terms of that being um, a lot of startups coming out of a tough time. Um, the second is that, oops, before I go into that slide, um, the second is that addressable markets are just so much bigger for companies. Um, if you think back to, you know, back in the mid-2000s or so, um, obviously there was technology, but in terms of um, internet, mobile penetration, um, distribution platforms that companies could use, and even just things like, like AWS and, and hosting services, all of those have just made it so much easier for companies to get started. I mean, you think about a developer could build an app in a weekend, right? I don't think that would have been possible 10 years ago. Um, and one of the things that I reflect on just from, from my own personal career is, I remember back in 2007, 2008, that was actually the period when I was working at YouTube, shortly after YouTube was acquired, and I was working on what I called sort of the, the stepchild um, or kind of the, the, the black sheep of the YouTube family, which was syndication. So how many of you, when you consume YouTube or videos, how many of you watch it on your phone? You can raise your hands. I, I, this must be higher, but <laughs> I'm gonna assume the majority of you consume it on your, your mobile phones um, versus your desktop. But back in 2008, it was completely flipped. So it was really frustrating to be working on YouTube mobile and, and APIs and knowing that the vast majority of playbacks happen on the desktop. Um, and as a result, when you think about companies who, who now, you know, distribution is on mobile, you don't really think of that anymore. It's kind of de facto. But back then, things like app stores and, you know, the iPhone and Android had just come out. Um, it was very, very nascent. But now, you know, more than 10 years later, that has opened up a huge distribution platform for really for developers and for startups. So really just like the number of people and potential customers that founders and entrepreneurs can access is so much bigger. 
So that definitely leads to um, just, just more opportunity. All right, so, oops, what's going on? So going back onto, I guess, like the flip side of, of, of unicorns and kind of more on the startup side, creating these billion dollar tech companies is happening faster than ever. So you can see here, it's a little bit hard to read, but you know, there are a number of examples where the average time from, from being started or actually really the first equity financing to becoming this billion dollar valuation, in many cases, it's, we've seen this happen in less than five years. So it's just happening much more faster than ever. And one of the biggest differences that we've seen is that this is, these are all you know, much more established older companies, as you can see from the timeline, um, the, X, the, kind of the, the top X axis. But you know, it used to be that a lot of these companies would hit even that decacorn valuation um, long after they went public. So if a lot of you remember these companies, you can see um, from the graph, really the orange to black is after they went IPO. But today, these $10 billion companies are happening not just faster than ever, but they're reaching those valuations you know, well before they even go public. And so we've seen that certainly in our own portfolio, but we see this all around the world. So this actually needs to be updated because a couple of these have gone public. But, um, but the point being, these companies hit those valuations well before they went public. And I think that's also something that a lot of us are seeing, that these unicorns are largely staying private longer, or when they do go public, it's, um, you know, it's, they're, they're already valued much more than um, their counterparts you know, from decades ago. Just an example here in terms of um, some of the large companies um, kind of hitting that valuation and, and what you know, really just a lot of them are um, in, in technology. So, you know, I spoke a lot about kind of a little bit of the context on um, kind of what defines a unicorn, like what, what drives this, um, what's been driving this phenomenon around the world. Um, and I spoke a little bit about kind of that FOMO in terms of maybe specifically corporates, but frankly, this applies to governments as well. A lot of the work that we've done around the world is governments obviously are not corporate strategics, but in terms of that mentality on that urgency to, to transform their economy, um, you know, looking at how to create jobs, they do want to really make that investment now because this is not something that happens in a year or two years or even five years. It's an investment that starts now that will take you know, 10, 20 years, um, but if they don't start now, then they're going to be in trouble um, later on. So when you think about kind of what industry is next, you know, just about probably every industry around the world has been or will be disrupted by tech. Um, and so in thinking about like what, you know, what can you do, you know, that's a lot of what corporates and governments are thinking about today in terms of um, what, how they can not be defeated by these unicorns and, and technology, but how they can actually um, embrace it. So a nice summary of what I just talked about is, you know, as technology continues to accelerate the pace of disruption across all countries in industries, um, governments and corporates need to find ways to, to tap the startup ecosystem. All right, so that was my brief kind of um, summary of dynamics of unicorns and kind of like uh, kind of a primer for the next couple topics that I want to talk about. So a bit about 500. Um, so 500 is an early stage, a global venture capital firm. We are based in Silicon Valley or specifically San Francisco, but our presence and our team and our portfolio are global. So in nine years, our portfolio now spans more than 2,200 companies. About 50% of them are from outside of the US. We have a great team and presence in maybe more than 20 countries around the world, um, including here in Seoul. And we are founded really on this mission. And you know, back in 2010, this was a very contrarian view that talent exists all around the world. The next unicorns, that term didn't exist, but the next billion dollar companies would not be from Silicon Valley. And that there was much more than just investing in companies, and that was it. We really felt strongly that um, helping the companies um, build successful businesses, as well as the fact that there are so many different stakeholders that make us an ecosystem go, we had that belief from early on. And so um, that was really our mission. So what I, like I mentioned around, um, in terms of 500 around the world, 
this number keeps changing, I said 2,200, so 2,300 portfolio companies across 75 countries, and in total across all of our funds, we have um, over 580 million in capital under management. You can see here the dots represent where we have people, as well as what we kind of consider primary geographies, but we have invested in, in a lot of countries. This represents maybe 40% of the world, um, 75 countries. So um, with this global footprint, we're quite you know, proud of that contrarian bet back in 2010. And now seeing um, you know, the fact that I'm here in this room, even you know, being able to share our learnings with you all is a great testament to the fact of how much this globalization is happening and that we're really well positioned to lean in further and continue to, to you know, kind of serve and carry out our mission for the next 10 years and so on. Um, this is just a nice stat in terms of global investors and counts of investment. So this was based off of PitchBook um, that we were ranked number one um, last, um, the last year, I believe, in terms of uh, global investments. And we hope to continue keeping that standing. Um, and a snapshot of our current portfolio, just to give you a sense of what companies we have invested in, um, as I mentioned before, just looking at the highlights for our unicorns, you know, more than half of those, or sorry, close to half of those are outside of the U.S., including one um, that I'll have the honor of speaking with tomorrow, um, and you'll hear from today, uh, Buka Lapak. So um, I mentioned before in terms of what we are, if, if, if someone asked me today, you know, what is 500, I would tell them you know, five, exactly what I just said on stage. 500 is a global venture capital firm. But really, the way I like to think about 500 and what we do is really seeing entrepreneurship as kind of a full stack uh, for, I guess, the, the developers in the room, that we are working very hard to bring entrepreneurship around the world, um, not entrepreneurs themselves, but really supporting entrepreneurship so that it's sustainable um, and then has a great impact on, on the market. Certainly, number one, venture investing, actually deploying capital into early stage founders is a big, big part of that, and that's kind of what drives us today. But a lot of the other activities we do that aren't necessarily investments, they all feed into this um, kind of this virtuous cycle of bringing entrepreneurship around the world. So accelerating companies, um, educating both founders and investors, helping to develop ecosystems, so working with governments, nonprofits, corporates, to help build ecosystems around the world, um, and then corporate innovation. So we think all of these things really fit together to help build an ecosystem. So that was a, a bit about 500 and kind of a taste of, of, of what we do and what our team focuses on. So the last part I'm going to share with you is what we have found our own learnings, and, and I will preface this with saying that we are always still learning um, because the world is changing so rapidly and there's so many dynamics in different markets and sometimes things are out of our control when it gets into even like geopolitical things that impact what we do on the ground. But really what we've seen as the, the key components and ingredients to building what we think will be sustainable and thriving ecosystems for entrepreneurship. So, to count I, I, uh, to make sure I had the right number. So there are about seven things that we've found, um, you know, from our work that really help drive and um, encourage uh, an ecosystem for startups. So I'll, I'll go in a circle. So number one is certainly that you have the talent, you have startups and entrepreneurs, and the good thing is that, and I and I can say this as we've been doing this since 2010. There's no shortage of talent all around the world. That's why we made that bet to invest in, in founders outside of Silicon Valley. You know, back then, investing outside of Silicon Valley, you know, even other domestic cities in the U.S. was a little bit questionable. But to make that bet and invest in founders in Latin America, India, um, Korea, um, the Middle East, it was, it was definitely questioned quite a lot. But really, just philosophically, talent exists all around the world. And so that's definitely something that's it's usually low-hanging fruit for a lot of markets. Accelerators. So what we've seen, and certainly from our work, because we run um, an accelerator based in San Francisco that is now on its 26th batch, 
Um, accelerators can be quite impactful in terms of really providing an environment for startups to, to grow and scale, to get that mentorship, and hopefully learn best practices in terms of avoiding pitfalls. Obviously, having downstream capital is another very important part of uh, building a thriving ecosystem. And frankly, this is where there's oftentimes the most efficiency in markets. There's money everywhere. There's capital all around the world. It's not necessarily allocated to alternative assets, let alone something as risky as venture capital, let alone something as risky as early stage venture capital. Um, so this is oftentimes where we see that there's the most gap, the biggest gap for founders. Um, but what we've seen also is that for founders in these markets, they've, they've adapted to that. And so they learn how to bootstrap and build businesses that don't necessarily require outside capital. But then the downside, of course, is that you know, for markets around the world, if you're really looking to build um, kind of that ecosystem or kind of very, um, to put it very, I guess, bluntly, if, if there's that mindset of we want the Silicon Valley mindset, we want to bring Silicon Valley to this market, um, a lot of it is that these investors have to be willing to take those risks. And in some markets, we just haven't had that time to develop that, um, to develop that cycle of, um, of investors um, getting that upside from companies that have exited. So again, this is something that, um, that we've seen from our work is, is improving, but it's still a gap. So public institutions. So um, you know, this, this conference is great because of um, you know, who is organizing and sponsoring from the Korean government. And I think that is a great learning in terms of the fact that the government does have a big influence on helping encourage startup growth and entrepreneurship. So education and training, um, a lot of this is, you know, when you think about universities and ap academic institutions, they can certainly help encourage as well in terms of creating that talent pipeline. Um, you know, just as a you know, personal story, when you think about Silicon Valley, oftentimes you probably think of Stanford as generating a lot of these future entrepreneurs and founders. There's a lot of resources, both from the curriculum as well as just organizations and that environment that help get students really excited and interested in, in building companies. Um, UC Berkeley, which is my alma mater, starting to see a lot of that as well. Um, so universities are very well positioned to, to get access to, to young talent and encourage entrepreneurship. Corporations, so I mentioned before, there's a lot of corporations that struggle with this because they see this transformation happening and they necessarily aren't necessarily well equipped to adapt. Um, and sometimes what we've seen is a lot of these large organizations have a carve out that focuses on innovation. So it's sort of kind of isolated from the rest of the company, which doesn't necessarily help the, the broader organization because um, whether it's the DNA or the culture of the company or just the fact that maybe the, the products themselves are becoming irrelevant, um, it doesn't really always have that impact. But um, corporates do have a you know, play a big role overall in the, in the startup ecosystem. They will partner with these companies, maybe acquire them. Sometimes as there's been an influx of CVC, they too invest in early stage. So they still play a very important role in making this go. Um, and then finally, kind of just like the overall community and access. So um, just kind of as a fun, you know, funny example, like in, in Silicon Valley, oftentimes you can walk into, maybe in certain cities, but San Francisco certainly, Palo Alto, you know, you can walk into coffee shops and you'll hear people just talking about their startups. Like there's many times you'll walk into, you know, Phil's Coffee and, and Forest Avenue in Palo Alto and you'll hear a startup that's pitching an investor. It's just kind of all around you. If you think about Hollywood, it's all entertainment. Washington DC, all you hear is politics. Um, but you know, that's kind of a very high level example, but really just the fact that the community itself, everyone is trying to encourage, and it, it, it is something very mainstream. Um, that's something that doesn't happen overnight for sure, but it's one, of the, it's one of the things that do make a big difference in terms of encouraging entrepreneurship, that there is that network and community that's present. Oops, all right, so. 
So I talked about those are the seven kind of key components, and there probably are other subcomponents of that, but those are ones that have stood out to us in all the work that we've done in markets all around the world, both investing in companies as well as working with all these different stakeholders um, who all just have a very strong desire to, to build out this startup ecosystem. Um, and producing unicorns is certainly kind of a, an, an indica indicator of their success, but really they just want to transform um, you know, their, their markets. And so just giving kind of our example of how we see global innovation for 500 startups, internally we've called this a flywheel because a lot of times there's, you know, we kind of are just strategically wondering when we invest in startups, but then we say work with a big corporate to help them with innovation, or we work with universities like Stanford or Berkeley to help educate people who are interested in early stage venture, how does that all fit together? They seem kind of like discrete things. Actually, they're not. Like I mentioned before, when you think about an ecosystem, all of those stakeholders um, have an impact on building a sustainable startup ecosystem. And for us, we see this really as a flywheel. So we invest in, I'll start from kind of that top corner. You know, we invest in companies early on. We accelerate them. We help build cross-border hubs around the world, so kind of accessing international markets working with corporates to help access our startups or help them learn how to innovate, educating local investors. These all kind of really just, they spin, I mean, they, they kind of, you know, work together in terms of, um, in terms of what we see as a, a flywheel. Um, and that's how we, that's how we really um, kind of carry out our mission in terms of um, helping support talent around the world. And we've seen, you know, a lot of um, early stage venture firms around the world that have also been trying to do kind of be a VC that's more than a VC. Um, but that just kind of goes to show you that there is this huge demand to bring entrepreneurship everywhere. Um, and there's just like a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity to, to make an impact that goes beyond just simply writing a check and going away. Um, this is probably just repeating what I said. So investing in, in funds or through our funds, um, open innovation, kind of working with corporates to help um, help them access innovation, help them work with startups. Oops, excuse me. All right. So I believe this is the last part of my, uh, my, uh, my presentation, but um, really looking at kind of the four key stages of ecosystem development. So number one, activation. So really encouraging entrepreneurship and, um, and, and bringing that education to founders. Uh, number two is expansion. So as these companies grow to become kind of seed stage, really helping them to hit product market fit um, and be ready for scale. Globalization. Um, the interesting thing is a lot of companies are actually thinking about going global from day one. This is a, a, start, you know, a stark difference from you know, even 10 to 15 years ago. But really, being positioned to help your companies connect um, around the world is, is key. And the last thing is maturity. So really, as these companies mature, and hopefully they do, um, although as we know, the vast majority of companies may not make it to this stage, but really once they get to that maturity, that you can help support those late stage entrepreneurs. Um, and a big part of this is what is the liquidity um, path for these companies? Are they gonna be exiting, go public? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the exit options? And so finally, you know, really three key resources, if I can recap everything, is having that expertise um, in terms of founders, mentors, a network that can really help startups thrive. Number two, capital. So to build a great business, you need capital. Um, so this largely will come from a community of investors that have that appetite for early stage. And then the last is market, so access to global networks, which includes not just other startups and other investors, but also corporates, governments that are um, incentivized to help companies thrive um, and help them scale. So as a quick case study of this, um, one of our partnerships that we have with Enterprise Singapore is designed to help kind of accelerate um, growth of startups in not just Singapore, but broader Southeast Asia and around the world. Um, and so this is comprised of two different parallel programs, kind of bringing companies from Singapore to San Francisco and then vice versa, because there are a number of companies that are founded, certainly in Singapore, who want to go global. And, and oftentimes that means come to the US or you know, outside of Asia. But we see that happening the other way too. 
a lot of Silicon Valley, San Francisco-based companies who want to go to Southeast Asia. And so it's programs like this, and this is specifically with the, the government of Singapore, um, that have helped um, to spur that. So just wanted to share that as a quick case study. So um, that is it for me. Um, I'm, I really appreciate um, your, your, your kind uh, attention, and um, hopefully this is something in terms of us sharing our learnings about what we've seen over the past nine years with 500, and really what, what we see going forward is something that you can take with you in terms of learnings, whether you're a corporate or a startup or, or a government. Um, you know, there's a huge opportunity. I only see this growing from here, and I'm excited to see um, especially what happens here in Korea. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.